So we will be talking today about <clears throat> heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, to start talking about heavy menstrual bleeding, we must understand that there is a big change in the nomenclature today. <clears throat> and actually, um, uh, all those terminologies, the old terminologies that we all knew, like menorrhagia, metrorrhagia, and all this huge list you see here is no longer used. And today, uh, for the most common problem like menorrhagia, what we use is heavy menstrual bleeding. And this is a big change that we all must get used to it. So we will speak the same language. What's the definition of heavy menstrual bleeding? Actually, it's a, it's a woman who is losing more than 80 milliliter of blood per month, per cycle, sorry, per month. Usually it comes every month. Uh, but uh, nobody, nobody is measuring it. Nobody can measure it. No woman knows how many cc's she's losing per month. They usually don't even know if they are bleeding heavily or not. So <clears throat> the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence, the NICE in England, has proposed a better, uh, a better uh, definition, which defines excessive menstrual blood loss uh, when it affects the quality of life of women, physically, emotionally, socially, or materially, and can occur with alone or with combination of other symptoms. How, <clears throat> how, how many women are suffering from the problem? About 10 to 15% of fertile women, and it increases with age. It means that in the 40s, uh, we will find many more women than we will find uh, in the ages of 20. Uh, it's quite a burden and women who have heavy menstrual bleeding are more likely to visit a physician, to go to emergency room and to undergo surgical procedure, which part of them are, of course, unnecessary. Uh, what's the reason for heavy menstrual bleeding? Well, there are two, two, uh, uh, two main uh, categories. Today, the FIGO has the, defined the uterine bleeding as the palm coin classification. The palm is relates to structural abnormalities like polyps, adenomyosis, myomas, malignancy, and hyperplasia. <clears throat> While the coin has uh, uh, no physical problems uh, where we have coagulopathy, ovulatory dysfunction, endometrial, iatrogenic, and not yet classified, what we are going to talk here about is only about what we call idiopathic heavy menstrual bleeding, which means there is no, <clears throat> no physical reason for this. Um, now, how does it affect women? We can see that it's not only that she has to change more tampons or uh, tampons or uh, sanitary napkins, <clears throat> it affects her in sexual life, in physical activities, in productivity, in sleep, in ability to travel, productivity. And you see on every aspect of life, women who have heavy menstrual bleeding are affected. Not talking about the fact that a high percentage between 21 to 67% of them will develop um, uh, anemia, iron deficiency anemia. So what are the treatments that we have today? We have the non-hormonal, <clears throat> which is the tranexamic acid and NSAIDs. We have the hormonal, Mirena, uh, combined oral contraceptive, which I divided into two groups, the classical one with the tinyl estradiol and the newer ones with the estradiol, progestogens. And we have got surgical, of course, endometrial ablation and hysterectomy, which once was the main treatment for heavy menstrual bleeding. I will start by going exactly to the end by saying that today, no question that the Mirena uh, is the gold standard for every treatment, uh, which is um, non-surgical to treat heavy menstrual bleeding. And if we look at all those countries, Canada, US, UK, France, Finland, Spain, the first line, <clears throat> the first line to treat Heavy menstrual bleeding will be the uh, levonorgestrel IUS, in this case, the Mirena. So it is accepted all over the, the world. 
And what are we talking when we're talking about Mirena? Just to remind you, or those who don't know, uh, the Mirena is an IUD or, your, or what we call IUS, intrauterine system. It releases a progestogen, the levonorgestrel, at a rate of 20 microgram per day in the first year. And uh, it provides, apart from treatment of heavy menstrual bleeding, it provides also contraception. I wrote here for five to six years because it is, uh, it is licensed for five years in most countries. Now in the US, uh, a few months ago, it was licensed for six years. Uh, how does it work actually? <clears throat> As we can see here, the menstruation, the menstrual cycle during ovulation, um, the endometrium lining is growing and uh, expecting a, a pregnancy. Once the pregnancy does not come, the lining falls out as a menstruation. What happens that the progesterone, which is uh, secreted inside the uterus, prevents this rise of the endometrium. And actually there is no endometrium rising. So it's not that something is left inside and does not go out. <clears throat> it just doesn't let the endometrium grow. So sometimes there is a very small bleeding. Sometimes uh, women don't bleed at all even. How much is the decrease in the bleeding? It's about 97% after one year. You see, it's a lot really. Very, very impressive. If we look here in the menstrual blood loss from 176 ml, which is a lot per month, drop to few uh, drops. So here is another article from 2012 with 95%. So it's very, very, very effective. What about the other treatments that are that are on the market today? We've got the antifibrinolytic agents, which are led by tranexamic acid which is very, very cheap product. So it's very easy to use. It does reduce quite nicely, about up to 44% in bleeding. We've got NSAIDs. NSAIDs can reduce bleeding and reduce, of course, the pain that comes many times with this bleeding. Uh, when women bleed heavily, they have a lot of dysmenorrhea, also up to 39%. But once again, when we compare this to Mirena, <clears throat> you can see that the Mirena uh, in few articles shown here, the Mirena, this is the reduction of the Mirena and this is a reduction of, of um, NSAIDs here of the tranexamic acid. So no question that the Mirena is much better. What about progestogens? When I was a young doctor, they told us to use progestogens 10 days per month, trying to reduce the amount of bleeding. Uh, I think that is from this lecture, you will go out and you will understand that this is nonsense and this should never, never be used because it's really a bad treatment. Uh, I've done my job because uh, really the, the best we can reach is 22% reduction, which is nothing. Yes, if we use progestogens, during almost the whole month from day five of the cycle till day 26, we can reduce bleeding very, very impressively by up to 87%, but it has a lot of side effects. So it's usually used for short-term treatments. And once again, when we look compared to Mirena, a Reduction of blood with day 16 to 26 is very small. Success of treatment also with Mirena, impressively, much better than with the progestogens. <clears throat> what about combined oral product contraceptives? We all use for many, many years uh, oral contraceptive to reduce bleeding in women who are complaining of heavy menstrual bleeding. But apparently the reduction is not so high as we expected and it's about 43%, which is impressive, but not enough. Now we have a new generation of oral contraceptives. Till now we had oral contraceptive with etinyl estradiol. Now we have two products. One of them is with estradiol valerat, which converts in the gut to estradiol. And we have got a second product which has 17 beta estradiol. I'm talking about 
the Clyra and the Zoeli. These are two new, new relative, relatively new products, already not new, but relatively new. <coughs> and they are, sorry, they are very, very good in reducing bleeding about 88%, which is second best to Mirena. So uh, this must be noted that this is one of the best treatments for heavy menstrual bleeding. And we can see here for this Clyra, for example, we can see that from baseline of 142, it went down to 17 ml. So it's a very, very good product and Zoeli is the same. So if I would have to summarize, if we just look, for example, at the green line, which show us what happens after six months. So no question that placebo does nothing. The Levonorgestrela US, the Mirena is the best. Second to it is, this is um, a data of Clyra, a contraceptive with estradiol. Medroxyprogesterol acetate day 12, 16 to 26 is not worth anything given for a long days, five to 26, it is effective. And the uh, NSAIDs and tranexamic acid are effective, but they are far from, from what Mirena is. So today, actually, our best treatment, uh, non-medical non is Mirena. And if we look at the Mirena again, uh, women who use Mirena, report when they are compared to women using tranexamic acid or NSAIDs or combined oral contraceptives, women report that they have got much better, uh, they have much more improvement in uh, social life, psychological health, physical health, work, family, which means it doesn't only impact the amount of blood, but also all those problems I was talking before that women suffer from them when they have heavy menstrual bleeding. And we can see what is happening all over the world. Like for example, this is from Denmark, a big study, which shows that between 96 and 2017, uh, cyclic oral progestins were reduced in use. Tranexamic acid was about 50% less used for, I'm talking about, of course, heavy menstrual bleeding treatments. And this is, by the way, the cyclic oral progestins, I'm very happy to see this 0.1 because it means that almost all doctors there in Denmark, they understand that it's a useless uh, treatment. Uh, tranexamic acid, 50% reduction. On the contrary, Mirena rose up from 2.3 to 32 uh, per 1,000 women years and uh, the other hormonals, endometrial ablation, and hysterectomy also 30% reduction. So there is, a, there is a big change happening. You can see also the number of hysterectomies done in England for here still written menorrhagia because it was about 10 years ago published. And we see that from the date the Mirena appeared, the truth is also we have to take into account that also ablation uh, occurred in these years, but we see the decline in, in uh, hysterectomies due to heavy menstrual bleeding, and you can see it all over the world. If we see no question that taking off the womb, making a hysterectomy will have a 100% success as far as heavy menstrual bleeding, there will be no bleeding. Uh, but it has a morbidity rate of about 40%, mortality rate even, and when we look at endometrial resection and ablation, we have a high rate of reoperation and 30% will eventually have hysterectomy. It doesn't have also any um, uh, contraceptive effect. <clears throat> when we compared Mirena to endometrial ablation, we can see that this favors Mirena, this left side, this favors endometrial ablation. We see that after six months, 12 months, 24 months in the uh, in, uh, sub articles that were reviewed and summarized here, the Mirena is as good, if not even better than ablation. <coughs> when we compare the Mirena to hysterectomy, so there was an equal improvement in health quality of life, equal satisfaction of the treatment, high occurrence of complication in the hysterectomized women as expected. 
42% hysterectomy rate still in the levonorgestrel group at five years. But I don't see it. I mean, people tell me this is, you see, this is a 42% failure. I don't see it as a failure because 58% uh, of women just underwent a simple procedure at the clinic of the doctor, the insertion of the Mirena, and were spared of hysterectomy. So yes, it doesn't succeed always, but it is a very good product. This is one of the articles I like. It's a very old article from 1998. But what they did, they took a group of women who were supposed already had a, a date for hysterectomy and they divided them into controls and women that were inserted with uh, the Mirena. And you can see that 64% of women inserted with Mirena, they canceled their, their surgery, while only 40% was uh, with the placebo. So no question, it's a good product. Now, the problem with heavy menstrual bleeding is that a huge number, about 50% of women don't know that they have a heavy menstrual bleeding. A lot of them, they come to us after the general practitioner took a blood sample and found out that they have an iron deficiency anemia and he sent them to us. And then they don't even have an idea that they are going around with an anemia and heavy menstrual bleeding because that's what they're used to. <clears throat> so, only five to 6% of women with heavy menstrual bleeding consult the doctor. This is a very small number. Now, how do doctors, uh, when we make a survey in many countries, so each doctor in each country tries to see differently how he measures if a woman has heavy menstrual bleeding by the amount of blood, by sanitary napkins and so on and so on. Uh, and there is this, uh, picture a blood count that we try to see that the woman writes down and gives a score to every uh, size of blood uh, drops or clots. But it, it's good when you make an article, it's not practical on a day-to-day -day, uh, day -day, uh, life. So what we have now uh, in production, there are two companies which I am happy to be uh, medical part in both of them. One of them um, is Gals Bio, which <clears throat> is now producing uh, in the state of producing, we are not yet in the market, a new tampon, which is called Tulipon, which is inserted exactly like uh, a tampon into the vagina and it collects the blood for about 12 hours. It has two to three times more capacity than, uh, than uh, a normal tampon. And once we pull this string here, when to take it out, it closes and actually everything collapses and comes out without leaving a drop. If we look here on this presentation, you can see how it is inserted. It opens in the vagina. Uh, it collects the, the blood that is coming. And then when we pull the string, it closes and actually it comes out with all the blood inside. Once it comes out with all the blood inside, we can put sensors inside <clears throat> what we plan to do. One of the simplest things is to <clears throat> measure the amount of blood that is inside this Tampax. It is the tampon, not Tampax, sorry. And the... Uh, right. And it can give us uh, um, it can give us an idea of the amount of blood. It can tell the woman on the on her phone or her cellular phone she will get a message telling her that actually she's bleeding too much and she it's better for her to go to a doctor. And this is the most simple thing because in the future 
what we need, what we want to do there is to put their biomarkers that can be found in the blood of women. We can monitor uh, infections. We can monitor uh, uh, even uh, trying to monitor to see uh, uh, vitamins, mineral, STDs. We can do a lot of things at home and we can also send the blood to a lab and have tests for cancers or endometriosis and so on and so on. So this is one of the future things that we are now trying to develop. Remember that uh, nobody um, um, today is offering actually dilatation and curettage for heavy menstrual bleeding. It's really, really, really reserved for extreme cases that come in a danger of life to the hospital. And this is contrary to what was happening when I was a very young doctor. So <clears throat> we, sh we showed you also how many problems the ablation have. So now I, another company, which I'm taking also part as a doctor there uh, is uh, Ocon. Uh, Ocon is the developer of a product which is already in the market. It's an intrauterine device, which is called Ballerine Intrauterine Ball. And now <clears throat> we are developing um, the next product, which is called Seat Spherical Endometrial Ablation Device. What is happening is that uh, it's a ball-shaped memory uh, nitinol device that is also like a ball, exactly like we saw uh, before, threaded with 29 chemically active substances. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, with Argentum nitricum. Uh, Argentum nitricum is the same one we treat many times when we have bleeding lesions in the cervix. So these 29 chemically active substances, they dissolve immediately into a paste when they go inside the womb and they spread the, the, the product all over the endometrium. Most of the beads disappear from the frame after 12 to 15 minutes and fully dissolve after 22 minutes. And then we remove it after 25 minutes. The, the product is removed only uh, naked without the beads. We tried first the product on preclinical in animal studies. It was proven to be safe to use, causing no perforation, leakage, or any other clinical signs of uh, uh, adverse events. Then 10 women, uh, eligible women, which were just about to under, undergo a hysterectomy, they were inserted with the product. The insertion was simple, no complication and uh, no severe effects were seen in those women. So now we started the uh, second stage of 16 women, age 37 to 50, where, <clears throat> with a baseline of very heavy bleeding, PBAC score of 424. We need to be less than 100 to say that she's bleeding normally. Uh, all procedures were completed successfully without device or procedure related adverse events and a very low mean pain score. Uh, 14 of those women were evaluated of six months with a mean uh, of PBAC, which was 95 from 424 reduction to 95. This is how the uterus looks in those hysterectomized women. <clears throat> we can see here what the product is doing to the endometrium. We can see also that there is no penetration beyond, beyond the endometrium. And actually, uh, they dissolve into a paste that uh, ablates the blood capillary uh, vessels. The penetration depth of the active material is self-limiting to the basal layer of the endometrium, which is good because that reduces the chance of having, for example, a, a perforation. Of course, this procedure can be done only to women who, uh, where we do not need the histology, okay? We, because if we need histology uh, of the cause of the bleeding, uh, this cannot be used. And here we can see those uh, 14 women that we had, 82% average drop in PBHC. 
95% reported quality of life satisfaction. And uh, now we are uh, starting our phase two study with many more women. So this could be a future of, uh, of a treatment that can be done in emergency room. For example, a woman comes with heavy menstrual bleeding to the emergency room. Instead of running and making a, an emergency DNC or other pr procedures, she can be inserted with this <coughs> SEAD for 25 minutes and then go home. <coughs> it can be used also at home in the clinic. Sorry, not at home. It can be used in the clinic of the doctor. And it can be a very revolutionary uh, product. Of course, it's a kind of ablation that does not need hospital and does not really need a special skill to do it. Thanks. That's all. Thank you, Professor Baer, for a wonderful lecture as usual. And we would like to thank you from Zivanza for being ready to give this lecture despite being quarantined at home. And uh, we missed you in Dubai and look forward to meeting you and your twins in Tel Aviv in March. And uh, uh, we will call you again to Dubai for a physical lecture later in the year once this virus problem settles down. There are a lot of questions for you now from the audience, but we will take them at the end of my lecture. Today is a patient webinar and uh, I'll quickly finish my patient lecture. And then after 20 minutes, we'll take both our questions together. Uh, you can, you know, relax for some time and just chill and come back and we will do this once I finish my lecture. Thank you. So the official topic for today is IUI. Yesterday for the doctor webinar, the topic was clomiphene, but I made a mistake and I instead took the IUI lecture for physicians with references, current references till 2021. But today is a very basic lecture for patients on IUI. The clomiphene for IVF, the patient lecture we will take next month. And uh, for the patients who are beaming in from uh, Africa and Asia, and we have a couple of patients from Eastern Europe, the topic today is a very simple topic, IUI. It's the commonest fertility intervention that the, the a gynecologist performs on an infertile couple. In the year 2016, that means five years, six years back, uh, there was a survey done by a Singapore-based firm, and only on the Indian, only on the Indian subcontinent there was 1.6 million IUIs done in one calendar year. So IUI is really prevalent and, you know, it's the basic treatment done even in uh, small villages in India today. So what is IUI? IUI is the therapeutic introduction of sperms which are made ready outside the body to make them fertilizable. And that process is called capacitation. We use certain chemicals, culture media, we call it, to make the sperms imminently fertilizable. After we process these sperms, in simple terms, there are good, bad, and ugly sperms. We separate only the good sperms from the bad and ugly sperms and give them some sort of boost that they go at a higher speed towards the egg, which lies waiting in the fallopian tube. And hopefully one of these capacitated sperms will then fertilize the egg that lies waiting in the fallopian tube. So IUI is the therapeutic introduction of capacitated sperms in the upper uterine cavity. To understand the process of IUI, you must understand the function of the human cervix. Cervix is the mouth of the uterus. So it gives rise to cervical secretions, which keep these sperms alive. Once after intercourse, the sperms are ejaculated in the vagina and normal reproduction. It is the cervical and vaginal secretions that keep these sperms alive. After the ejaculation, the sperms go and store 
and stay in the cervical cribs for up to 72 hours and then uh, over the next 72 hours are thrown up in the upper uterine cavity in asynchronous waves. Physiological filter, all the dead sperms, epithelial cells, vaginal cells, everything, the debris, hair, everything is filtered out by the cervix and it is only the sperms that go up to the upper uterine cavity. And capacitation is the function of charging or boosting the sperms to make it eminently fertilizable. So the function of the mouth of the uterus is this three. And what we do with IUI is exactly the same. We carry out the cervical function in the lab. We get rid of the debris, abnormal sperm, seminary plasma. We pick up the good motile sperms. We do this process outside the body in the lab and then deposit the sperms in the upper uterine cavity. So what are the traditional indications of IUI? Unexplained infertility, cervical infertility. That means if a woman undergoes some cervical cauterization or some procedure due to which the cervix is cut or shaved off, then it loses all the gland bearing areas. So it's a dry vagina and dry cervix. So we bypass that by doing an IUI. If your counts are low, if your Motility is low in the male semen analysis. Retrograde ejaculation in husbands or partners who have had some prostatic resection, they have retrograde ejaculation at times. And the sperm ejaculation, instead of coming anti-grade outside the body into the vagina, goes back into the bladder. So we alkalinize the urine and then ask the man to urinate after his ejaculation, we get the sperms along with the urine in a jar, give it to the lab and they separate the sperms from the urine and then process it for IUI. In developing countries, you have males working in the Middle East and they come after two years only for three months back home, two or three months. So at that time, we, we process multiple samples of sperms every three days and store them. So even in the husband's absence in IUI can be done. Immunological infertility manifests as agglutination of sperms, mild endometriosis, occasionally mentioned in literature, allergy to seminal plasma, multiple failed IVF, sometimes multiple IVFs fail and we come down to doing a lower technology procedure. And in most of the developing world, inability to simply afford IVF. What are the contraindications? Unhealthy tubes, acute genital infection, hyperstimulated ovaries. For example, in the UAE, if there are more than three follicles, we are not allowed to do an IUI. Today, twins are considered a complication of any medical assisted reproduction treatment. Twins have a 20% chance of spontaneous abortions and preterms labor, and it's considered a complication today. Medical, psychological, social contraindication, sample collection is by masturbation, if there is a viscous sample that is not liquefied within an hour, it can be processed in the laboratory by a competent lab. For patients with very low counts, less than 5 million, who cannot afford ICSI IVF, we pull their ejaculates two or three times in the day from morning 8 to evening 6. The husband is given some Viagra and then we ask him to ejaculate two, three times and pull the ejaculates and then process for IUI. There used to be swim-up methods from 1978. In the 1990s, density gradient separation was the favored child. But today in 21 and 22, in most of the modern labs, you have microfluidic sperm sorting chips. So these are this is nanotechnology where you put in the sperm, raw native sperm in one well. There is culture medium in this track that you see. And the good sperm migrate along this track and reach the other end where they are taken out, where they can be removed and directly used for IUI. So there are three types of, there are three types of chips available, one for IUI, one for IVF, and one for XC for very low counts. So this microfluid sperm sorting chambers have really improved the traditional pregnancy rates when you compare them with the older methods in use with IUI cycles. And 
this is a rough rule of the thumb that the predicted odds of getting pregnant with IUI is highest when your total progressively motile sperm count is at least 5 million. This is how a process sample post-wash, post-processed or microfluidic post-processing from a sperm chip, it looks like this. So you have very clean forward progressively motile sperms. How do you time IUIs? It used to be 36 hours. Now, if you have to do a single IUI, it's 40 to 42 hours after the HCG trigger, which has shown to give better pregnancy rates. If we have to do two IUIs, one before and after, then you do it at 24 hours and 40 hours after the HCG trigger. And again, 18 millimeters is not the holy grail of stimulation, so follicular size varies with whether you have got stimulation with clomiphene citrate or fertility injections. If you use clomiphene citrate, we trigger at 22, 23 millimeters. If you have gonadotropin cycles, then at 18, 19 millimeters. Also endometrial thickness, that eight millimeter is really not the holy grail of endometrial thickness. Even if you have four or five millimeter endometrial thicknesses, you get good pregnancies. So. And, you know, you have to get this concept out of your mind that clomiphene citrate is inferior to letrozole. Clomiphene citrate and letrozole have similar pregnancy rates. And for couples using their own sperms, when you do two IUIs, it's better than doing a single IUI. This is a paper from 92. This is a paper lower down what you see from 2019 and nothing has changed. And this shows this study is an old study, but it is true till today. The best rates of IUI are maximum 25% and the best results are when you use fertility injections with IUI. There are reasons for high pregnancy rates when you use fertility injections in IUI. And basically you have more, it's like going to a bowling alley. If there are a lot of skittles there and you throw a ball, you're bound to hit something. So when you produce multiple follicles and put in sperms, you're bound to get easier pregnancies. IUI is not beneficial to women above 38, 39, 40. You should try just two or three times and then move to IVF. This is true right from the beginning that fertility injections or gonadotropins are better than tablets when you do an IUI. There is no superiority of letrozole or clomiphene when you're using tablets. Do not repeat IUI more than two, three times. Always prefer gonadotropins if you do want to do an IUI. And there is no valid reason to withhold women from immobilizing 15 minutes after IUI. Longer bed rest after IUI does not help increase pregnancy rates. More than 15 minutes bed rest is not required. After the sperm sample is processed for IUI, do not keep it in the incubator for more than 60 minutes. So this is a must. The longer you keep it post-processing in the incubator, your pregnancy rates keep falling down. Like with any other medical procedure, IUI has its complications if done not in aseptic areas, not under a laminar hood, the processing is done. And it's done with ready-to-use kits outside, sometimes in a kitchen pantry in an obstetric nursing home. You can have severe complications such as peritonitis, Infection can go up from the lower genital tract to the upper genital tract. On the other hand, there are papers which tell that sperms can be even retrieved from the rectum and give pregnancies. This man had a urethrorectal fistula. Every time he would ejaculate, the sperms would land in the rectum. So the doctors collected the ejaculated sperms. First, the rectum is given a wash, clean. Then he ejaculates into the rectum with a glass pipette. They picked up the sperms and he completed his family, got two children with IUI, with sperm retrieved from his rectum. So what are the take-home messages for IUI success? Do not inseminate a large amount, not more than 0 0.4, 0 0.5 processed sperm. The softer the catheter, the better the results. And the procedure must be finished within two minutes maximum time. Do not push in in few seconds, take your time. 45 to 60 seconds is the ideal time to inject the 0 0.4, 0 0.5 ml. And ideally, one must do the IUI in a partially full bladder with transabdominal sonography guidance. If after the procedure, the catheter has blood then or blood on your panties later, the chances of pregnancy go down. So now we will, this was 
you know, what the patient should know about IUI. Uh, 